Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie? Welcome back to Remember That Movie. I am the third Alejandro Rosa on IMDb. And I am Steve Johnston, and I am not on IMDb. And welcome back to our podcast, here where we look at the movies of the past with the eyes of today. This episode is brought to us by Steve. Where are we going today? We are headed to 1994, and we watched a not very well-known movie by the name of Radioland Murders. Now, when I mentioned this title at the end of the previous episode, you had sort of a, a glimmer, a glimmer of a recollection, and you said, I think I've heard of that one, or, or something to that effect. Had you actually heard of this movie? Had you watched it? And if so, how did you watch it? Because not a lot of people did. The honest answer is, I'm not sure. Mm, okay. If I watched it, my recollection is almost non-existent. I do remember the poster because I looked at the poster and I went, I've seen that poster before. Now that might just be that I saw it at a video club and never checked it out. Or maybe I held the VHS box in my hands and never okay. watched it. Having seen it now, I don't think I actually ever watched it before. That was going to be my question because typically if you have remembered maybe watching it, you will start watching it and go, oh, I remember this now. But I'm guessing that did not happen. No, I think this was truly my first time watching it. What about you? What is your history with this film? The history is somewhat brief. My friends and I watched this in high school shortly after it came out on home video. Now, I do not remember if it was Mike or Adam who found out about its existence. And gentlemen, if you happen to be listening, number one, how did you find me? And number two, I apologize, I don't remember which of you brought this up to us, but they insisted that, oh, there is this film. George Lucas was involved. It's not well known. We should watch it. And so we rented it. We got together, you know, a bunch of high school friends, popped it in, watched it over the course of the evening and absolutely loved it. We were quoting this film throughout the rest of our high school years, in particular, it's not the sound of the human head smashing. I can definitely see this being a high school quoted film, for sure. Oh, it has yes. a lot of quoted yes. lines in it, yes. <laughs> it was good, it was good. There was many giggles from my desk last night. I was hoping so, because having loved it back in high school, re-watching it, I was concerned. I thought, oh, is this going to be one of those that just did not age well? No, I loved it just as much now as I did then. That's kind of a preview for my opinion on sure. you know, yeah, what's to come. Way. But, Don't uh, give it all away. I won't give it all away. I'll just say I still really liked this film. So I'm, I am glad to hear that you were chuckling. Yeah. That part. However, I do have a lot of questions. And I'm hoping that I have some answers okay. for you. Okay. Because I have no history with this film, I have never read about this film. I have never experienced this film. I really watched it last night. And the first thing that I will tell you is... The speed at which this film goes. Oh, yes. It is very fast. Scenes go from scene to scene to scene to scene. And so it was interesting because normally what we do is we will watch a film and we'll be taking notes. I didn't have time to take notes because if I looked down to write something, I missed like four jokes. Five things went past you that you did not. And, and the pace was consistent throughout the film. Oh, yeah. So you really had to pay attention. And again, you look away, you miss something and you didn't want to miss it <laughs> because sometimes it was all connected or whatever, or the joke was just funny. I, I started writing notes and then I had to give up because I, there was too much going on on screen for me to follow and write notes. The only other option would have been ample use of the pause button, which I think would have ruined the flow of the movie. <laughs> First and foremost, can we talk about who is in this movie? Because that was one of those moments where I was like, oh, so-and-so is in there. And, and you, 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 and oh my God, how many actors are in this that I know? This is an ensemble cast. And I really shot myself in the foot with this one. I like to look people up, find out what they've been in. Okay, what were they doing at the time when they were cast for this movie? Where would you know them from, etc.? Yeah. I could not do that for this because the list of everyone who is in it is so dang long. So I've got 
the cast list kind of broken into three parts. There are what I consider to be our three main characters. There are the sort of larger supporting roles, the important characters to the plot that don't necessarily get the, the main standing. And then we've got the cameos. And here's the thing, folks, for those of you watching, the three of you, I have the cast list pulled up on my phone because just to keep up, just to be able to actually say, oh yeah, what about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? Because there's just, so, the cast list is so long of comedians and actors, all famous at different levels. So anyway, tell us about our, our main players, please. All right. So the three that I kind of tag as our three main players. First, we have Brian Ben Ben as Roger Henderson. He is best known for playing Martin Tupper on HBO's Dream On. Aha! I see the smile. I Excellent. know Dream On. I watched Dream On when it was a very inappropriate age for me to watch it. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, there was a lot of sexual content in Dream On. I haven't seen it in years. So tune into our other podcast, Remember That Show. Yes, that is him. Wow, that's incredible. But anyway... I interrupted. Playing his wife and brains of the entire radio station operation is Mary Stuart Masterson. You might know her from Fried Green Tomatoes or Benny and June or a number of other movies. She made a unexpected cameo in our previous episode, assuming you kept that bit in, where you attempted to say Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio and said, Mary Stewart, and it's like, nope, nope. And I did think about that. I thought of how ironic it was that we were now doing one with Mary Stewart Masterson, which is much easier to say. Now, if it makes you feel any better, I had her confused because I thought at one point she was Catherine Mary Stewart. Oh. Rather than Mary Stewart Masterson, so. These three name people. Three names. Yeah. All, all Marys. What's with the Marys? I don't know. And then our third main character, also with three names, is Scott Michael Campbell, playing the page boy Billy. This was his big screen debut. He had appeared in a number of smaller television roles, went on to do multiple other films. The ones that I recognized were Flight of the Phoenix, and he had a role in Brokeback Mountain. Now for our celebrity actors who are in this. How about we do a rapid fire and you just list all of the people who are in this movie because it's a ridiculous amount. Go for it. We have Michael Lerner, Ned Beatty, Jeffrey Tambor, Brian James, Stephen Tobolowski, Michael McKean, Corbin Burnson, Bobcat Goldthwaite, Anita Morris in her final film performance, Larry Miller, Christopher Lloyd, Harvey Corman, Dylan Baker, Jack Sheldon, and then we've got cameos by... Joey Lawrence, Billy Barty, who has been on the podcast before, Peter McNichol, Robert Klein, Ellen Albertini Dow, Candy Clark, Bo Hopkins, Wilbur Fitzgerald, Tracy Bird, and in their final film appearances, George Burns and Rosemary Clooney. What an insane list of performers. Like I said, folks, watching it, I could not keep up with all the people that I was seeing. I will point out for anybody who's been listening to this podcast for some time that Billy Barty, I believe is a name that I mispronounced the last time we did a film that he was in, and there was a commenter who corrected me. Uh, I think it was on YouTube, because uh, I think I said Bartley. So I apologize to Billy Barty and his family, and anyone who was offended by my mispronunciation. Do not feel so bad. The audience will never know that a second ago I mispronounced Ned Beatty's name. <laughs> We cut that out, Steve. We cut that out. All right, Steve. Can you give us a synopsis that is brief and lacking large amounts of detail? Radio station WBN in Chicago is going national and have planned a gala evening of their best shows and musical acts to wow an audience and hopefully their new sponsors and affiliates. The night must go off without a hitch, which means that backstage is organized chaos. An eccentric cast of characters is not making things any easier and things get worse when the one main sponsor demands rewrites to half of the shows 15 minutes before they go on the air. Things then go from bad to worse worse when people start dropping dead. Writer Roger Henderson finds himself as the prime suspect, and to clear his name he sets out to find the real killer. He is helped by the brains of the entire radio operation, and his wife, Penny, and an enthusiastic page boy named Billy. 
Can he discover what links the six victims and identify the murderer before the evening is through? Bravo. Very good. Yes. Was that short enough and omitted enough detail for you? It was concise in every wonderful way. Well done. How did this movie get made? Who made this movie? The story of this movie starts back in 1973 with George Lucas. At the time, he is working on American Graffiti, and he has an idea. He wants to pay homage to the sort of slapstick comedies of the 1940s, and he also really loves old radio dramas. So he wants to blend the two together and do kind of a murder mystery at a radio station. When he turns American Graffiti in to Universal Studios, he says, hey, I want to give you kind of, you know, first first right of refusal, if you will, on a couple of ideas that I've got. First, I've got this sci-fi film that I'm working on. I want it to be a sort of a big screen adaptation of Flash Gordon. And then I've got Radioland Murders. Universal looks at American Graffiti, sees how it does in theaters and says, yeah, yeah, sounds good. In fact, they go so far as to announce in 1974 that Radioland Murders is being produced. George Lucas gets the writing duo of Willard Hike and Gloria Katz, who had worked with him on American Graffiti, to actually put together a script based on his ideas. And then it falls into development hell, because George got busy. Because that Flash Gordon adaptation that he had in mind, he couldn't get the rights to Flash Gordon, so he wrote his own original sci-fi movie, which was Star Wars. And once Star Wars came out, George just didn't have the time to go back and work on Radioland Murders. So it sat on the shelf for 20 years. Wow. In 1993, Lucas approached Universal again saying, hey, I still have this pet passion project from, you know, the 1970s. I still want to do it. And what's more, I can sweeten the deal because uh, my company, Industrial Light and Magic, we have made such giant leaps forward in terms of computer-generated graphics and digital matting that we can produce this film for $10 million. That's all we'll need. And Universal says, fantastic, do it, but first update the script, because the script that was written in the 1970s contained a whole bunch of references to radio shows that an audience of the 1970s would absolutely have understood. We're now in the 1990s, you gotta update things. And when you start casting, we want you to pull in as many well-known names from now as you possibly can. So look at, you know, who is a big TV star, who's big in the movies, get those people in and we'll make this work. The movie was shot over the course of 90 days toward the end of 1993. Then it was released in 1994. When it was going to be released back in 1974, or thereabouts, Lucas was actually going to be the director. By the time the 90s roll around, he doesn't have the time to do that, so he hires Mel Smith to direct. Uh, Mel Smith is a British comedian, actor, and filmmaker. You have actually seen Mel Smith. In what? Do you remember... The Princess Bride. Yes. Do you remember the pit of despair? <coughs> Don't even try to escape. The albino is Mel Smith. The albino is great. Mel Smith is great. Mel Smith was chosen in part because Lucas thought that the British sense of humor that he brought would be perfect for the tone of the film. They did a, a round of principal photography and then they took a break. And during that break, Lucas Smith, the editor, on a fourth person whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, took a look at what was shot, came up with a list of rewrites, and then called the entire cast and crew back for two weeks of reshoots. During those two weeks, Mel Smith was directing one unit, George Lucas was actually directing a second unit, and sometimes they would be on the same set. So as Mel Smith yelled cut, Lucas would yell action, and his side of things would fire up while Smith's eyes wound down. Good lord. So, chaos. Which kind of fits, given the, the theme of the movie. So, it is chaotic. It is such well-timed chaos, though. This is one of those movies that is kind of like a clock, where there's a lot of pieces moving all at once, but they are all moving in sync so that it works so remarkably well. This is a flawed comparison. But I think mm -hmm. when you think about a door farce where, you know, 
Everyone's coming in and out of doors and multiple things are happening all at once and one character runs through one end and one character runs through the other. That's what it felt like to me. It had a real noises off, a real clue Mm. sort of feeling Mm. to it. But double the amount of people involved, triple the amount of stuff happening at the same time. Because the plot is going on throughout the course of the film, but the show, the Radioland show, is going on the entire time. Because the whole point is that they don't want to stop the show because they don't want to scare away the advertisers. So they keep going while all this chaos is happening in the background and people are dying and people are chasing after people and they're still doing the show. So the film keeps cutting back and forth between what's going on backstage and what's going on on stage. It is so much chaos, but it's a good sort of chaos. Several actors made me laugh so much throughout this film, but Michael McKean and Christopher Lloyd. So we have to explain who these two characters are. So we have Christopher Lloyd. He is the the Foley artist. He is the sound effects man who is basically making sound effects to go with all these radio shows in real time. So as a character is creeping across the grounds, he's walking on a bed of pebbles, making the crunch crunch sound. He's blowing trumpets. He's yelling into watering cans. He is stabbing watermelons sort of brings some verisimilitude to what you are hearing over the radio. Through the course of the film, he never leaves his area. Chaos is happening backstage. People are on stage, and he's in his corner doing the Foley stuff, having no awareness of what's going on in the film the entire time. And what about Michael McKean? Michael McKean is Rick Rochester, who is the WBN band conductor. I could not stop laughing. At his just his, you know, he almost had like a cartoon caricature of somebody in charge of a band. I loved when he did, he and the band did the the Spike Jones style performance with Billy Barty coming out. Number one, because if you have ever watched any of the old clips of Spike Jones and his City Slickers band playing, they nailed it. it. It looked spot on. And secondly, it was kind of fun because Billy Barty comes out and sings that old Black Magic accompanied by the band, and Billy Barty actually sang that old Black Magic with Spike Jones's band back in the 1940s. So he was kind of reprising exactly what he did 50 years earlier. It felt like there were a lot of homage, a lot of odes throughout the film. Not every reference I got, but I could tell they were definitely doing real historical references at times or making fun of. And I was like, wow, this is, this is fascinating. I got the feeling that there was a lot of work and a lot of detail that went into the, the actual radio acts that were going on (laughs) behind the scenes of the plots that we're actually supposed to be watching. I don't know all of them. I know that the shadow was being parodied. I know that Tarzan was being parodied to some uh, degree, but beyond that, not 100% certain on all of them. Even with the updates, folks, we missed a lot. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We would have been more lost if they used the 1970s script. But what they used, I (laughs) I was like, I know I should get this. And maybe my parents would have understood this a little bit better than Mm -hmm. I did. Because I don't. Multiple times throughout the viewing, I found myself saying, okay, I do not understand what is being riffed on, but it's amusing. So I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it anyway. I don't have to understand what it's parodying. I can just enjoy it. Absolutely. And I felt the same way. Not all these folks are stars, but these actors, a lot of them were well known, who I've seen in other things, even if I didn't remember their names. And it was so great to see all these people combined together. I also loved uh, Mary Stuart Masterson. I thought she was great. Our main character, he was very slapsticky, very yes. cartoonishly, you know, running into walls. Roger Henderson. Even though that was funny, it wasn't always consistent as mm-hmm. far as they always seemed to do a lot of stuff with him in that way, but not everyone else. Everyone else was at a 15 and he was at a 30 as far as yes. the kind of slapstick yeah. sort of nature. I found that a little jarring. I did too. The only other character that came close I felt was Billy just because of the number of times that he got thrown out of a door into a wall across the hall. Yes. Which never got old. No, it was funny. It was funny. (laughs) But I I do agree with you. There were a couple of times where Roger's shtick just went on too long, Yes, I felt. You know how if you were doing a running joke or a a running gag, how it'll start off funny and then it gets kind of annoying. But if you keep going long enough, it might pick back up and get funny again. If you're lucky, yes. There, There were 
several scenes where Roger's thing started off funny and then kind of got annoying, and that's where they decided to cut it. It never got back to, to being amusing again. He was already quick-witted with lines, but then they also tried to make him be a physical comedy guy. And it's like, pick one. You can't do it all. You could have had Billy be the physical comedy joke, and you could have been the banter guy who keeps getting into the wrong situations. Now that you mention it, like that, I just flashed back to old Marx Brothers movies where the rest of the cast is playing it straight, except for the Marx Brothers themselves who are doing the slapstick ridiculous comedy. I don't know if that had any influence in this. I don't mean to cross pollinate films, but did you ever see The Imposters starring Stanley Tucci and Oliver Platt? No, I'm, I'm afraid I did not. That film has a lot of physical comedy. It has a huge ensemble cast, but the tone and the style is consistent throughout. And it makes sense. It makes more sense than the way they did it with this one. I say that just because I'm like splitting hairs. Overall, I do like it. I do like it. I do. I did enjoy it. I, I thought it was very funny. I thought it was very creative. That's honestly where it really got me was how smart, how complex, how much time it took to create the plot and then to create an actual radio show that needed to go on for the two hours of the film. That took a lot of work. What did you think of the overall murder plots? From a murder mystery standpoint, if we're just looking at it as a murder mystery, it didn't have the magic of a clue. Some of it was okay. Some of it was not. Honestly, the murders were not my favorite thing. <laughs> and I know that sucks because it's in the title. I was relatively happy with the murders. Oh, there's another sound bite for you. Up until the reveal at the end, when it is revealed what it is that links these six characters together along with the murderer, I felt that was a little weak. It's revealed that all six victims worked at a different radio station in a different city for a time, and there was an FCC scandal. But the FCC scandal does not play into the motive for the murders, at least so far as I could tell. It was something very different. <laughs> still related, it just happens that, oh yeah, no, it is still those seven people from that old other radio station, but not that scandal bit, which you think would probably be the thing uniting them and sort of providing motive to the murderer. I was also not a huge fan of how the murderer eventually met his end just because it kind of came out of nowhere, I felt. <laughs> I liked that the reveal happened in the play, like in the show, that that was written in and so they read the lines and then everybody looks up at the control booth. That bit was funny. I enjoyed that a lot. I agree with you that the backstory leading to the murderer doing his thing I was like, okay, this feels contrived. Like, oh, that's that's a very good way of putting it. Also, there was very little interconnectedness between the characters. And again, the, the speed of the film is so fast and there's so much stuff going on that it's even when they did establish connections between people, it was hard to keep up. It was hard to be like, oh, wait, they had an issue with who? Never mind. We're like five pages ahead now. We, we got yeah. up. <laughs> so in some ways, the speed maybe even hurt it a little as far as building up plot. I, I think that is a very valid point. We know for a fact that a couple characters despise a couple other characters and there's weird love triangles going on, but you never get the sense that the characters know each other beyond just passing each other in the hallway and, oh, we, we just happen to work at the same radio station. Yes, I'm the stage director. Yes, you're the singer. But that's it. And even again, the ones that we hear that they're having these conflicts, we don't see a lot of it. There's not a lot of build up to it. So when we get to the deaths, Number one, we're not bought into these characters yet. We just don't know them enough. You know, mm -hmm. again, think of think of Clue. We have the establishing of the characters and then things start happening around, you know, but like, I just felt like they weren't connected enough and we did not have enough time to care about their deaths. I can agree with that. That's not helpful. You have to disagree. That Sorry. makes for good content. You're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. Steve. How did this film do? Was this a George Lucas hit? Because I've never heard of it. That should be your answer right there. <laughs> the movie was released in October of 1994. Its final budget was 15 million. Lucas 
over around the 10 million projection just by a little bit. And it grossed, are you ready for this? 1.3 million. You know what? We have talked about movies bombing. That may be the worst number <laughs> that we have ah. ever said as far as comparison from budget to box office. Yes. It was only released to 844 theaters, which I think might have had something to do with it. You can't make money on a limited release. I also think it had something to do with the timing because the week prior, Pulp Fiction opened and the week after, Stargate opened. Jeez. I think that the movie just did not resonate with the audience the way the studio hoped it would. You mentioned the pacing. This film hits the ground running, does not let up, and I love it for that. I think it, it works great in terms of the film. But did critics agree? Time magazine noted that the film was very fast paced and thought that was a detriment to the film. They felt that like in most other comedies, you need to have peaks and valleys so that you're going fast paced and then you get a chance to kind of catch your breath, yeah. take things easy, and then pick up the pace again. So they thought the film was too fast. The New York Times thought that it was trying too hard to pay homage to the 1930s. And then we've got Roger Ebert, favorite of the podcast, because he comes up with some good quotes. He called it all action and no character, all situation and no comedy. Oh, So no, this did not do well at all. That being said, I still love this film. It's got some issues, admittedly. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I still think it is a wonderful cinematic gem. And I would love it if it got more viewers, more eyes upon it, because I, I do think it's worth it. I think what was committed to film excellent. It is a good film. It is not a great film. It has its flaws. I think some of its strengths are also its flaws. I, I have to say, like, Ebert's right. Too much going on, not enough going on. I think that the speed is fun and is interesting to watch and it's visually stunning, but I think things were lost. I think character development was lost in the process. And so wanting to care about these characters is hard to do when you're just seeing them in a blink of an eye. Does it hold up? That's the question for you, Steve. Does it hold up? In my opinion, yes. Now, I say that, but I realize that it probably holds up as well today as it did in 1994, which was not very well, according to the box office and the critics. So maybe I want to say that it actually is better now than it was back then, perhaps. I think the film is worth it. I think it is worth a viewing. As you say, slightly flawed at places, but I think it holds up as well as it did then. I do have to shout out to Joel McNeely, whom we have not mentioned yet. He was the composer for the film. Not only did he do the orchestral music to you know, go behind the, the drama side of things, he also wrote all of the jingles for all of the products. Marvelous thing is, is that if you go out and buy the soundtrack for this movie, you get the jingles. And they're great. They're absolutely great. So fun. There was one of the radio programs that made me laugh and made me do a little bit of introspection. I forget the title of it, I'm afraid, but it was positive. The announcer comes on and says, oh, it's the, the story of this British explorer. That was probably the most clever, unexpected moment in the entire film. During all of the radio acts, you see the actors on this stage standing in front of their microphones holding their scripts. And as the announcer is saying, oh, you know, here we are, we've got the, the British explorer and his African-American guide. No, this is my African guide. That's yeah. right. We see on the stage a very large, well-dressed African-American gentleman and a skinny little white guy off to his side. And at the back of my mind, I went, oh no. Please don't do that. We then cut away from the stage back to, I think, Roger and Penny or Roger and Billy, I forget who. Over the loudspeakers in the background, you hear this voice that says something along the lines of, I say, this appears to be the cursed tomb of some in something or other. And then you hear a voice go, Uka Luka Maka Vuka. Inside, again, I'm going, no. Yes, you're dying. You're no, dying a little. You're no. like, oh, I picked this movie oh. and look what's happening. But then we cut back to the stage. And what do we see, Steve? We see the little scrawny white guy go, Ulua Hana Nua. And the large African American gentleman go, easy for you to say. That was 
freaking hilarious. I laughed so hard at that. I, yeah, I lost it. And Christopher Lloyd gives an outstanding performance as our Foley guy. Christopher Lloyd was on set for one day. They had him for one day of shooting and that was it. He didn't even meet anybody. He just came in and they put him in a room with all the stuff. That's amazing. To summarize, I think this movie's great. I think people should go out and at least give it a shot. And then you could at least say you've experienced it. That was the dog. I think he's right. I think it is time that we wrap up Radio Land Murders, unless there is anything else that you would like to say about it. It's a fun ride. If you want a kind of just silly movie with some really great comedians, highly recommend for that. Is it going to be the best movie you ever saw? No. Is it going to be the best murder mystery? No. But it's fun. I give it a solid B minus. Okay. You know? I'd, I'd have bumped it to B, but B minus is all right. So there you go. You have forced my hand, sir. I have. I have. Yes, you have. Oh. By giving us this giddy comedy, you mm -hmm. have forced me to push the pendulum to the dark side. So as it is my turn next, I'm going to take us back a few years to 1987. And we are going to watch a film that I know very well from the past, but definitely have not seen since I was a child. And that film is the action sci-fi rated R Robocop. Oh, thank you so much, folks, for listening or watching. Please feel free to like, comment, leave a review. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you at the next one. Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie?